YouTube, this is Larry with Pinup Amusements in Wyoming. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about routing pinball machines and if it's for you or not. I'm going to specifically talk about the challenges today on these, this really unique business. And we're going to begin with getting started. In the very beginning, there's two things that you need to have, you need to do before you even think about getting started. First of all, you need to have the ability to buy at least two games. And uh, the second thing is you need to have the ability to move those two games. Uh, I use a van. I have a nice system for uh, moving my games rather quickly. Uh, I do have a setup that's set me back about $30,000. It's a, it's, an, it's a van and it's completely loaded. It's an old electrical van. It's completely loaded with all my parts and tools. And I have a uh, rolling uh, table, hydraulic table. So I go into a, a location and I jack my machine up. I pop the games off with an impact wrench. I lay the header over. I put a blanket around my game and then I roll it into a ramp and I move it to the next location. So you're going to have to have something like that because to begin with, these games need to be rotated. They do get boring after about three months. You'll see your revenue start to taper off and you need to pop it into another bar uh, to re cue that uh, enthusiasm on your game. So the best thing about this business is you, you can uh, get multiple locations and you can continue to rotate them out. It feels like you have a shit ton of games, but you might not. Uh, the other big challenges in this game or this business is getting the pinballs even onto a location. Uh, bar owners have very, very, very bad experience with pinballs. And we can thank our, our previous predecessors who did pinball routing in the 90s on the last big boom. Uh, most of these guys would buy games and they would throw them into a bar and they would come in and just pull the money out. They would never maintain it. They'd never change balls. They'd never fix rubbers. There was always broken switches. There was lights that were out. So, you know, they, they were more or less like a chunk of wood sitting in the corner of a bar that nobody ever played. And since that bar makes a commission off of every game played, they have a bad reputation with pinballs. So it's actually really hard to get pinballs into locations. Uh, plus they're noisy and uh, people have, you know, they're like, I don't want that thing in the corner making all this racket. Uh, you get into new bars like breweries or barcades or something like that. It's going to be a little bit easier to get them positioned. But you have to really prove to these, these owners of these locations that you are going to take care of your machines. They're going to be premium machines. And if you can do that, then it's, it's a revenue stream for them that's free money. Uh, and the more games you have in one location, the better it is. So some of the best locations that I have had are four games minimum. If you can get more than that, even better. But that's because people will go out and they'll they'll treat it as an evening out to go play pinball and they're gonna want a big selection of games to play. So if you're looking at a bar with just one pinball, then it's not gonna do very well. If you have two, it does better. If it has three, even better. Four, even better. After four, it's kind of just, uh, it starts to get expensive. You know, you can get $100,000 into one location. Uh, if you're willing to accept that and you know, you know that it takes some serious capital to get into this business, it is a rewarding business. But overall, it's a very challenging business. Most people who do do pinball routing also have jukeboxes, dart machines, pool tables, quarter pushers. You know, They have other areas of revenue and they're going into that bar and they're cleaning all the stuff out at the same time. I got into the pinball business because I wanted to play pinball and I couldn't find any machines in my area. So I did talk to a barkeep and he says, yeah, I'll, I'll let you put a couple in here. So I bought a couple games and I put them in his place. And since I did that, I have also expanded my business further into other coin op machines, you know, such as uh, arcade games, buck hunter, uh, jukeboxes, pool tables, et cetera, et cetera. So that is an area where if you're already in there with pinball, you might as well jump on board with the other stuff. I can tell you uh, for a fact, pinball is the least profit making it is the most expensive one to buy, and it is the most maintenance required. So if you don't love working on these machines, then don't even think about it because working on the machines is probably 60% of the job. When I go into a location, I don't just count quarters. I have to actually go through and maintain all of these pinballs, and that's what takes me the most time. Uh, one location that I have the most in, uh, they have nine games in there, and it's an eight-hour to 12-hour day every two weeks to go in there, maintain everything explicitly, count it out, and uh, 
and then put everything back together and get the heck out of there. So it is a definitely a, a job. It's not like it's just residual income and you just put a, a pinball in and you just, you know, collect a paycheck. There is a lot involved. And then also you got to get the buzz of pinball in your area. So I do do tournament events every month, which takes, you know, an entire day to plan ahead of a website that I maintain and everything else. So with that being said, Pinball routing is an incredibly hard business, and unless you are willing to invest, you know, in my in my experience, I would say a minimum of fifty thousand would get you to where you could probably uh, justify getting into the business. But if you don't have fifty grand to spend, you know, you have one or two games. You know, there's people out there that just have one or two games that are at their buddy's bar or something. That's that's cool. That's cool. You know, go that route, but. If you're really looking to get into it, it's going to take you some money. Uh, my moving system that I have, like I said, the, it's a van and it's completely chock full of parts. I have 30 grand into that alone. So uh, then you got to think about the games that you're going to buy. So I did start with Stern, 100% Stern games. And then Stern started getting really challenging on their games because they were focusing to the home use only sector and not to the uh, routing operators. So Stern's on my shit list right now because uh, I bought a few of their newer games and man alive, they just sucked on location because they were so hard to play. You got to make these games fun or nobody's going to put a dollar in them again. You know, yeah, everybody puts a dollar in one time and if they get ripped off because they have a drain matic you know, a Star Wars or Jurassic Park or, uh, you know, something like that, they're, they're not going to do it again. It's, uh, you got to make the game uh, pretty easy for them. With that being said, Stern does keep to their basic principles of their they were a routing business. You know, they they did focus on operators, so they are easy to put cash boxes in. They are easy to put uh, the tournament mode button on, which is amazing for Stern. It does bring a lot of players in when you have tournament mode. Uh, they also you can tweak their code. You know, you can add time to ball saves. You can give them extra balls instead of replay or instead of free games on replay, that kind of stuff. So they do have a lot of positives. Uh, Chicago Gaming absolutely kills it. Anything they have, buy it. It's the number one best uh, revenue maker for me is Chicago Gaming's games. Medieval Madness, Attack from Mars, Monster Bash. I haven't put the Cactus Canyon out yet. And then the other sector to look at is uh, the old Williams games. People love those old classic games and they still are very good money makers. Uh, so definitely avoid JJP. I uh, bought JJP games. They're the most expensive of all, all of them. They break down all the freaking time and uh, they're just too damn hard. So, and you have to almost charge a buck and a quarter per play in order to justify the purchase of those games, you know, $12,000 for those games. Plus they're just fragile. I mean, they just, uh, I will never buy another Jersey Jack pinball again. They just suck. Uh, they're fun for your house or whatever. And I'm not down and I'm not downing, the people who own them uh, because I like their games personally, but on a routing business, they are just, they're not there. They're not, they're not up to Stern or Chicago game or Williams level. Uh, America pinball. I don't have any experience with. I'd be interested to see if anybody who's watching this video does route American pinball. I'd be interested on, on knowing more about how their revenue stream works, but uh, the best revenue you're going to get out of all of them is Chicago gaming and, uh, Stern. Now, given this is also different for wherever you're at. Now I'm in rural Wyoming. So there are, I have got a pretty good buzz of pinball fans in this area and they definitely gravitate towards the easier games. Uh, but Stern, I, I do love Stern. It's a love hate relationship. I uh, definitely have the biggest selection of games, but stick with the Sam models, the spike ones and the early spike twos because they are the best. I've had a lot of white stars out there. The white stars don't do so hot. Uh, I don't know why, because I like them. Maybe it's just the themes that they had. The white star themes were a little blah. You know, Wheel of Fortune, Monopoly, Elvis, that kind of stuff. I like those games, but the themes just don't seem to <clears throat> drag people in. And then also think about where you're putting them. So like Iron Maiden and Metallica, they do excellent, excellent, excellent in bars. But if you go put them in a boys and girls club, they're probably not going to do so hot, right? You might want to get an Avengers or a Deadpool or, you know, something that's a little bit more kiddie based, right? So 
definitely think about your theme. And that's another reason why I really like Chicago gaming. Their themes are generic. They're old Williams themes. Uh, so they fit everybody from kids to adults alike. Uh, they don't have a, a specific, uh, you know, like, hey, here's Star Wars. You know, for example, Star Wars, people put a dollar in because it's Star Wars. But there's also a lot of people who hate Star Wars and they're never going to put a dollar in it because they hate Star Wars. So you got to think about your themes really, really carefully. And then for uh, another huge importance is make sure you have resale value in the games that you choose. Get games that you think are going to be collector's items and, uh, you know, take excellent, excellent care of them. And that's where your actual return on investment will happen is when you go to sell that game. Uh, the entire time it's out on route, you know, that's it's going to make you a little bit of money, but it's not going to make you enough money to, uh, to pay for the game. Uh, on average, what I've seen is anywhere from 20 to 40 years return of investment, a return on investment here with a pinball at a buck a game and you're paying 40 cents to an, op or an owner. So you make your money when you sell the game again. So I hope this answers some questions or maybe <clears throat> opens people's eyes up on just how challenging the pinball business is. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, please ding in below and I'll try to keep updating these videos.